Well, thank you very much for joining me here today. Great. Um, it's great to have you. So welcome to the Ranting Pedagogue. Uh, this is the uh, podcast of the Virginia Tech Graduate Academy for Teaching Excellence. My name is Juan Shiaishi. Mm -hmm. I am a fellow of VT Great. Uh, and VT Great is a lovely little organization of teacher of graduate students with special interest in teaching, sharing ideas, uh, collaborating on like workshops and stuff. Uh, it's really it's a really awesome organization. I highly recommend it to all of you people out there. Um, so first, I'd like to mention the boring legal part. The views mentioned in this podcast do not represent the opinions of the school or VT Great. And these are our personal uh, personal views. Um, now, on to our guest. Uh, would you please like to introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, so my name is Sissy Meng. I am a second year master's student here in the Department of Geosciences at Virginia Tech. All right. When did you, so when did you get to Virginia Tech? How long have you been here for? Sure. So I arrived at Virginia Tech in August of 2021, pretty much right after they conferred my bachelor's degree. So I've been in college for an unbroken six years at this point, and I plan to graduate this May. Um, just got my defense date scheduled. Very Congratulations. Mm -hmm. When's your defense going to be? Uh, May 9th, May 2023. 9th. So if you are interested in manganese removal from drinking water, I invite you to attend. All right, manganese fans, you hear that? <laughs> or actually, no, it's manganese removal, anti-manganese, man and manganese <laughs> haters, manganese haters, you hear that. Uh, okay, so where were you at before Virginia Tech? Sure, so I'm a graduate of Penn State University. Cool. Google. Were you also in geosciences back then? Yes. Right on. Um, right on, right on. So tell me, what, what are some things that you liked about, um, about your educational experience at Penn State? What are some like good teaching practices? Like what did you enjoy about your classes there? And I guess what did you enjoy, what do you enjoy about your classes here at Virginia Tech? Sure. So I liked that at Penn State, the faculty were very much about hands-on learning and getting students to go out into the field to work with data and in in-class activities and kind of try to draw our own conclusions and do our own synthesis based on what we learned in class. It was very much felt like I was an active participant rather than someone who was sitting there and taking in information, even though, of course, there's plenty of that because you can't do the whole you know, original thought and synthesis part without first having the basics. Uh, and so I, I like that balance. And I think I would say that's also something I enjoy in my graduate level classes. It's more like a universal way that I like to learn. Cool. Good stuff. Um, so now going on to your, going on to your teaching experience, because that's what we're kind of here to talk about. Yeah. Um, so how has, how has your experiences from undergraduate kind of informed your current, your current teaching, your current teaching? I would say that how I was as a TA at Virginia Tech is pretty much in large part, at least I won't say pretty much all, but in large part based on my experiences with TAs at Penn State, because the program in geosciences there was, you no, know, it was similar in some ways in that usually there was a lecture and then there were like separate smaller lab sections headed by graduate TAs. And so given the fact that our department does not offer formal instruction for the TAs and Virginia Tech itself, as you probably know, does not offer much in the way of formal instruction for TAs either. Like that's how I filled in the blanks. Gotcha. Yeah, as a TA, there, I, I can relate. There's a lot that you don't know. I, I jumped in straight from undergrad to a PhD program at Virginia mm -hmm. Tech here. Uh, and day one, I got thrown into I got thrown into a TA. Thankfully, it was a kind of low stakes TA position. It was like an intro course where most of my responsibilities were office hours and grading but like you don't know what you don't know and when you yeah. don't know anything you really don't know anything uh -huh. so just quick quick extra plug that's why bt great is so good uh because we can we can we benefit from learning from each other about teaching and i promise that's probably the last plug that i will make for bt great uh during our conversation 
Um, so tell me a little bit about what your role is at the university. So specifically, like, what kinds of classes have you been a teaching assistant for here at Virginia Tech? Right. I was a TA for three semesters, and here in my fourth semester, I'm now on an RA. But my first two semesters, I was a teaching assistant responsible for two lab sections of a large introductory geology class geared towards civil and construction engineers with some environmental science students thrown in there. And then during my last semester of TAing, which was this fall, I was a TA in charge of one section of an upper division groundwater hydrology course in the geosciences department. Was that a smaller class? Yeah, so the class overall was a lot smaller. The TA team was also only two TAs versus five to six TAs for the intro course. Gotcha. So what was it like, what was it like for you transitioning, going straight from undergrad to being responsible for, for a lab course? Hmm. I will say it was a bigger transition than I expected. Managing the classroom was something I didn't have any experience with, and the fact that I'm roughly the same age as a lot of the students fundamentally changes the dynamic in some ways versus how the students would interact with the professor or the instructor of record for the class. So what's the, what's the, what do you think is the difference uh, in how students interact with you versus an older professor? Sure. I think the students definitely did not take my authority as seriously. I mean, I won't say all the students, most of them were polite and all that, but there were certain students kind of at the tail end of the bell curve, if you want to think of it that way, who were not as deferential to, you know, TA authority as they would be to a professor. Like they would, you know, freely walk in 30 minutes late after I finished lecturing like ask me to recap the lecture and you know go over things that they missed because they chose to show up late <laughs> and like talk while I was lecturing, which you know, is not something that I've noticed in my lecture courses that were taught by a full professor. Now by full professor, I mean like a faculty member, not necessarily, you know, full professor in the academic sense. Yeah, gotcha. Well, that, that sucks. Um, that sounds really, really obnoxious. Um, so, so I, I take it to, were you the only, you were the only person, like you were the only instructor, like present in the room. There was no professor like in the room with you when mm -hmm. you were teaching this class. I was the only person in the lab room with the students. Okay. So how did you, how did you manage that? How did, over the course of the semester, how did you, how did you manage like these students at the tail end of the bell curve that you've, you've described? So I don't think I ever developed a great strategy. You know, part of it was that I learned throughout my first semester that if I sent out the slides before lecturing, they would just take my slides and try to work ahead on the activity using the slides without listening to the important context or anything else I was saying. So. One thing I tried was sending out the slides after I lectured, which did help a little bit. I obviously am not looking over their shoulders while I'm talking or like throughout the lab section, but I did think that helped a little bit with, you know, people like not listening and then <laughs> having to ask me questions over and over again. Uh, other than that, I did I think develop more confidence or at least learn to fake a little more confidence. So I like projected my voice more, like walked around the room. So I was an active you know, presence in the classroom while I was lecturing instead of just standing in front of the PowerPoint and be like, hi everyone. So today we'll be talking about, you know, such and such that you know, at least it helped me feel like I was more in control. I see. So your issue, so the issue comes stems from like, um, it sounds to, it sounds like the issue is more like having control of the classroom and your difficulties having control over the classroom. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I tend to not be a very confrontational person, and my voice can be a little soft spoken sometimes. I don't like talking in front of rooms of people. 
which was something I had to do like pretty much every lab section. So that was a challenge. Gotcha. So thinking about, I, I can think of a fair few colleagues in that in that position who like don't like who don't feel like super super confident like going into going into their first class or like mm -hmm. in front of a group of students. So what advice do you think you would give to yourself if you if you met yourself just starting out teaching that class? I guess that's a good question. <laughs> you know, I might say what I told you about projecting confidence and trying to be an active presence in the room. I think I would also tell myself that I can't control the way people react to me. And so I shouldn't be super bothered if somebody is being blatantly disrespectful and talking about, you know, football game or March Madness while I'm lecturing. Or I shouldn't be, you know, all bent out of shape if someone makes a sexually inappropriate question or sexually inappropriate comment while I'm teaching or you know, tries to challenge me or, you know, antagonize me because they think it's funny or something like that. So we don't we don't have to get into it if you don't want to, but sure. the sexually charged comment like that was that just like was that directed at you? Were those directed at you? No, it was okay. not about me, thankfully. So I was substituting for another TA the second week that I was a teaching assistant, and like the third week I was at Virginia Tech. So I filled in last minute because the other TA was not feeling super great. And, you know, this class, it felt different in that there was this one table of dudes who were all like kind of stereotypical bro, bro types. And mm -hmm. I guess at high school or in high school, they thought harassing the sub was funny and they didn't grow out of that, even though they're full on men at this point and they should behave better. <laughs> and so, no, I was teaching. And this, this one guy asked, okay, what happened to our regular TA? And I told them, you know, she wasn't able to be here, so I'll be filling in. And you know, he made a comment about how, you know, oh, if she, you know, wasn't a TA, I would totally, you know what, it's not appropriate for lab. And I was like, what? Like, how do I respond to this? And so I kind of chose to ignore it. Um, part of me wanted to be a little snarky and be like, ah, you want me to, you know, collect your number and, you know, get you in touch with the other TA? But, like, at that point, I had no idea how to manage that kind of thing <laughs> because it wasn't something that ever happened at Penn State while I was enrolled there. And I certainly was not expecting that kind of behavior out of, like, college-age men. And so, you know, it kind of continued where I was lecturing and because I was teaching them about minerals, one of the properties of minerals is cleavage, right? And so there's, there's some going. snickering going. coming from the table and yeah. Uh, and then I also asked interactive questions while I was trying to teach them about mineral streak, which is what color powder a mineral makes when you, you know, scratch it. And so I was telling them, you know, if you've ever written with pencils, you know, think about what pencils are made of. And this one guy was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And I was like, yeah. And he's, I might, you know, I'm going to regret this. But, you know, he raised his hand. No one else is raising their hand. And he's like, they're made out of wood? And I'm just, oh my gosh. So at least that one wasn't sexually inappropriate. But, you know, the answer is graphite, and I wanted to show them that when you write with a pencil, you're writing with the streak of that mineral. Mm. And, you know, he was purposely trying to derail my point there, uh, which I did not appreciate. Mm. Yeah, that's gross, and that kind of conduct is completely, completely unacceptable with the students, and sorry that you had to, sorry that you had to deal with that. Um, but this happened, you said, your second week as a TA? Yes. Jeez. Okay. So, and you said, how did you, how did you deal with it? You said you kind of just tried to choose to ignore it. And, yeah. And, hmm. Like, I didn't feed into it because I figured if I did that, they would be more motivated to provoke me. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to the professor about you know whether I could file a complaint or anything like that. Um, and I was actually a little bit upset that the professor said, you know, you basically can't do anything. And I also talked to the TA who was in charge of that section. I think all three of us just didn't have much of a clue of how to handle that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Shoot. Well, that, that sucks. And that sucks to hear from a professor who should know, like, should know the mechanisms of how to handle this thing. Oh, the I, professor it ever... seemed like the professor was familiar with the different avenues, like Title IX and all of that. But you know, given the fact that it wasn't like pervasive, it wasn't repeated, it wasn't, you know, seriously impeding with anybody's ability to function in the classroom, you know, there wasn't much of a case. I so. see. Did that conduct, did you hear if that conduct continued or not over the course of the semester? I didn't hear anything else from the TA who was in charge of that section. So hopefully, you know, those people got it out of their system and they weren't, you know, asses mm. the whole time. Shoot, that sucks. That, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a tough, that's a tough topic. Like, how do you handle, like, how do you handle, like, how do you handle inappropriate conduct in the classroom? What would you do? What would you do now? Like, given that you've had several semesters of teaching experience now, and you have you did not have that at that point. That's a great question. I am not super sure what else I would have done. You know, probably I would. Yeah, I'm not super sure what I would have done differently because you know, in my conversations with the professor and with you know, others, with my advisor or with other people about that incident since then, you know, I don't feel like I've come up with a great solution or a great answer, which you know, maintains my professionality on one hand, you know, so I'm not like getting into the mud with them and you know, being a snarky person and all of that, uh, while also like, shutting it down wholesale and telling them this is not okay mm. yeah yeah you definitely don't want to egg them on you definitely don't mm -hmm. want to egg them on what do you so and but yes you do like i don't know i i it's definitely it's important to shut that down was this class i, I want to ask about the composition of this class was this sure. class entirely entirely men in the classroom um 80 percent gotcha. which was also the same of the lab sections i ta for the course since it was Civil and construction engineering. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, I just think about, I think about like, well, I'm, forgive me, forgive me for like, if I'm gonna say stuff that you already know, but thinking about like the position of the other women in the class, like aside from you as a teacher, like the students, like how they must feel to like have that behavior happen, just happen in their, in their class and the feelings that that must inspire in them, or well, not inspire, but the feelings that must cause in them in the yeah that sucks what do you think it was about these particular students that like or like the students or the classroom environment or the departmental culture or the college culture or the university culture what do you think it was that like let them feel so empowered to behave in such a ridiculous and inappropriate way i don't know their history or their backgrounds but I can maybe speculate that they speculate away. were rewarded for that kind of behavior by their peer group when they were in high school or when they were you know, freshmen or whatever else, and that they felt like you know, if they kept doing it, they would continue being rewarded. Um, it might also be because other people were in my position and didn't shut it down. You know, their other instructors might have been like, uh okay <laughs> and so that gave them a green light to continue i'm not sure i wouldn't say it was anything about the program or the department they were in because most of the the students you know certainly most of the the young men who i dealt with in the civil civil engineering and construction engineering majors were not like that gotcha yeah, it's a it's a tough situation. I want to share a story real quick, sure. if I may. But like, I I once had I once did a, a mentoring thing uh, for first year for first year uh, first year students, um, and at one point I made I made the mistake of opening up the conversation to like, um, oh, what is everybody's what is everybody's national background? 
um, where is everybody's where is everybody's ancestry from? And it got around it got to, it got around to me, um, and I told I, I told the table that oh both of my both of my parents are from Mexico, but my dad is of Japanese descent. Um, and one of the idiots to my to my right at the table says like says like <laughs> oh oh it's so south. <laughs> Oh, so South America, eh? I was like, no, 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 like, Mexico's part of North America. And he says, do we really consider it, in this exact voice, do we really consider it part of North America? And I was like, I'm gonna, I didn't know what to do. I was, I, I was just, I just looked at him. <laughs> I just looked at him with, like, my sternest look that I could possibly give. Um, like, bro, and, really? Yeah, like, really? <laughs> like, anywho. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't know what to do in that situation. Yeah. I did, like, my impulse was to, like, tell him get out of my classroom like get up and take your stuff and go away but i can't i can't do that yeah um you can't do that in a university or really and you shouldn't do it anywhere i don't think hmm. unless it's like unless it's like super, super super egregious unless your like university academic policy allows for it in which case go for it um but yeah i didn't i didn't know what to do so i just kind of i just kind of let it go and then like the semester kept happening his behavior remained obnoxious in different ways not in like racially charged ways but in yeah. different ways um but yeah it's a, it's a hard situation i don't know what i would have done differently thankfully um his peers his peers all like his peers like the other people at the table were also taken aback mm -hmm. um by the comment and i could see like some sympathetic glances coming from the other students that i was that i was chatting with so how did the other students in the room react to react to this situation? So I certainly didn't feel like anybody in the room was giving me like supportive or sympathetic vibes, but maybe it was just because I was under such pressure that I couldn't notice it. Mm. The other students weren't joining in. They weren't trying to stop them either, or like they weren't, you know, to their credit, giggling or doing anything else to not verbally encourage or reward what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's good that at least uh, at least most of your class was had some had some level of maturity appropriate for the university classroom appropriate for any classroom. Yeah, it shouldn't even ha it shouldn't even happen in college in high school, um, or middle school for that matter, or anywhere for that matter. Um, okay, so do we do we feel like moving on to our next topic? Yeah, cool. sure. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, and yeah, this this brings up a really important point. Like, I don't know. Like, we don't know how to. It, it's tough. To, it's really tough to deal with this. Like this. Like subtle, low level misconduct. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, sometimes I wish that. Like, okay, I don't actually wish for this, but sometimes, like, I, my sentiment, my impulse is like, give me a reason. Give me a reason to report you. <laughs> give me a reason to turn you in. Give me a reason to get you suspended or expelled. Um, but like. Obviously, we don't want that type of conduct happening either, but we also don't want this type of conduct happening. Uh, and so I don't know what institutionally or what as individuals we can do. Well, what is what system what institutionally we can do is probably like not much because institutions are hard to deal with, but individually, like yeah. and they're the customers of the university. They are the customers of the <laughs> university. Yeah, Where those, the parents are <laughs> those tuition dollars. Those tuition dollars and donation dollars mean a lot. Um, so yeah, I think that I think that you landed on what I what I like what I would like to call the correct correct answer in this situation. Like you just gotta I don't know, with experience and support of your fellow teachers and your professor, just shut it down, do your best to let them know that that behavior won't be tolerated in the classroom and hope that the message gets through. Thank you for sharing, Sissy. Yeah. Um so Next, we the next thing on my list is actually I want to I want to take it into a bit of a different thing that's not like on the that wasn't necessarily on anything. But what do you think makes for a good teaching assistant? Depends what the teaching assistant is responsible for because there's so many different roles mm -hmm. that are out there that all fall under the GTA umbrella. Okay. So what do you think would what do you think makes for a good teaching assistant in your in your in this position that you held um, as a lab instructor? So I think a good TA is somebody who is attentive to questions and prepared to help with the lab activities, which I admittedly was not always 
in the best position to do that for a variety of reasons, which we can get into. Mm -hmm. I would also say part of the TA's job is not only to take the questions that people ask, but to kind of be more active and solicit, you know, hey, do you have any questions on this? Or how are you doing on this activity? Because you know, if you don't come up to students and if you don't move around the room, they might not ask you. Mm. You know, just one thing that I've experienced is that if you just sit there, you know, typing on your laptop, that's one way to pass the time when they're doing the activity. But then at the same time, that gives the impression to the students that this person's not available, they're busy. Oh man, I don't want to be obnoxious and bother her. Mm. So being more active in the room is a big plus, and I think the students appreciate that. Definitely, that's something that I've that's something that I've tried to practice in my own in my own teaching, like with digit through digital means, like trying to like use discussion boards and like collaborative notes document. And like unlike you, I like to I like to distribute my lecture slides ahead of time mm -hmm. so that I can have my students like leave comments on them, like uh, almost oh. like yeah yeah. 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 They can like highlight things and like be like, what what does this mean? What the heck mm -hmm. is this? And then that that gives me during the class to that gives me a cue to be like, oh, like this this is what that means. I noticed somebody had this had a question here and a comment there. So mm -hmm. this is this is what that means. We, so we can go a little bit more into depth with it. Um, right. In an ideal world, I would give them out in advance happily. <laughs> I just didn't want to deal with the students not paying attention. Yeah, it's a tough it's a tough balance and like. And I think, as you as you kind of pointed to earlier, like it depends greatly on like the context of the class and the context of the stuff that you're trying to do, and the, and like your own personal context and your own personal like teaching style. Um, so continuing to we can circle back. We'll circle back to this one, uh, but continuing on um, the teaching stuff, um, you had told me you had told me that uh, actually. We'll, we'll we'll get to we'll get to that bit. Okay. Um, but I want to talk to you about grading standards because that's yeah. something that that's something that came up with us uh, in our initial conversation before before for this. Certainly. Um, so what do you think? So I guess yeah, grading standards. Go. Right. No, it it's a bit. So being the grader and being the instructor who's in the classroom with the students puts you in a bit of a tough position because many of the students, or I won't say all, I really want to be careful to avoid, you know, judging people too hard or generalizing them too hard. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the vibe I was getting was that some or a non-negligible portion of the students I was teaching were in the class to get a grade because it's required for their major. Mm -hmm. They need to check off that box, you know, before they graduate or before they get an internship or anything like that. And so they were just there for a grade. They didn't really see the importance of learning geology as engineers, which I tried to impress upon them. I don't know how successful I was, but I did try to impress upon them that this would be relevant to their future careers. And so a lot of them were there, or a good number of them were there just for the grade. And you know, I did experience a fair bit of, you know, like grumbling or not so subtly voiced discontent from the students if I handed back a lab assignment mm -hmm. and it wasn't what they wanted it to be, which is, you know, a 100. Like I, I would sometimes or a fair amount of time hand out like B's or C's on the lab assignments just based on, again, like grading from the answer key. <laughs> and there are people who weren't happy about that. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough because like, yeah, like exactly what you're saying, like being the person in the room being like, this is what I think of your work. Well, this is what I think of your work. Mm -hmm. It's tough for, I think, I think it is tough for some students to separate, like, to take it, to not take it personally. Mm -hmm. So like, because like for so long, for so long, like in this country, like that, that mark, that letter on your paper, like represents so much of your value. I think it's hard to like, disconnect disconnect like your own sense of self-worth from like that letter grade or from that like from that score out of 100. Mm -hmm. um i like i this is this is me like it's just speaking from like my own experience and from uh 
uh, my observations of like my students and like my classmates back in the day that like it's a very like your your value can be very much tied to grades and if your value is tied to grades and you are face to face with somebody who is like this is what I think of your work mm -hmm. I think that your work is not good it's tough to like it's easy I guess I should say it's it's easy to make the jump between like oh this is what from this is what I think of your work to this is what I think of you and I think that you suck um, which is not which is not at all what we're trying to communicate as teachers mm -hmm. um, like that's never that's never what we're trying to communicate as teachers um, and I think it's like I think it's unfortunate that a lot of students don't realize that and I think it's like I don't know why I guess I guess I'm telling you I guess I'm telling you a lot of mm -hmm. my thoughts do you what do you think do you do you agree do you disagree I think that might be part of it also having a good GPA puts them in a much better position to get jobs mm -hmm. and when you're taking four or five classes a semester you know, having a B or a C in this one 200 level geology class might feel like a slap on the face if everything else is an A, like an A minus. Yeah. And that that one stupid class is dragged down your GPA, <laughs> which yeah. I've been there. And that GPA, that GPA is a whole like, it, yeah, continuing to it continues to tell you about like your value to like your value to mm -hmm. an employer. Um, having that number on having a good number on your resume, I know from experience is like it's really important. Yeah. Um, and I, I struggled pretty hard to get my GPA up good enough to get into grad school. I did, but mm -hmm. stuff. Um, Spoilers. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, I made it to grad school. Yeah, good job. Uh, so, um, anywho, before we got, so before the students are there for the grade, so how do you, how do you handle it? Like, how did you handle it if, like, a student, I, if a, uh, I don't know the the relational aspects between you and the student. Like if you had to if you had to give them if you had to give them a bad mark or a low grade, like um, and a, say for instance a student like um, like shut down and started to shut down in the class and started to like uh, not engage as much with the work and started to let the quality of their work slide. How would you have dealt with How would you have dealt with that type of situation? If somebody was just not turning stuff in, or if they were turning in shoddy work. Um, I guess, I guess we'll start with if they were not turning your stuff in. I don't know, I'm imagining, like, a hypothetical where, like, that, a student, like... That did actually happen to me. Oh, okay, so how did you, what happened? Like, tell, yeah, tell us, tell us some background. How did it happen? Sure, so I had one student the first semester I was teaching who, they were genuinely going through mental health issues and personal issues in their lives, which they recounted to me at length you know, during office hours. But as a result, they often didn't turn in assignment, or there was a point where they had a backlog, something like 10 labs that they straight up had not turned in. Okay. And to their credit, they did show up to take the midterm. So they weren't totally an absentee student. Mm -hmm. And they did respond to me, you know, maybe a few weeks later when I would email them saying, Where's X Lab? Where's Y Lab? I haven't seen you in a while. What's up? And you know, it got to the point where it was the week before the semester was over, and the student, you know, I kept reminding them, like, turn these in so I can give you a grade, and you're not going to fail this course. Or you know, I repeatedly recommended that they withdraw from the course or take an incomplete if their personal issues were truly getting to be too much, but you know, at the end of the semester, they were just like, hey, like, can you please give me an extension you know, because X and Y, and I really need to pass this course. And it, it was tough because one, I sympathized with all of the personal issues they told me about, which I won't get into. Mm. But on the other hand, I'm like, really? It's not fair to me. And I kind of need to draw a boundary at some point and say, you have things going on in your life, and I understand if they're keeping you from being the student that you can be, but I'm also not going to break myself 
in order to accommodate you when you're not you know, working with me, mm -hmm. right? And it sounds like you did just about, just about everything you could, like leading up to leading up to this final conversation, like offering uh, offering all this advice to like I don't know, turn in the assignments or like get extensions and then withdraw from the course. Even like I've mm -hmm. had to withdraw from one or two courses because of mental health problems. Um, it's not fun. It's not fun, and it's like it's a crappy moment. Um, and it's like it's kind of a it's kind of it was kind of it was tough for me to like look at myself in the mirror and mm -hmm. be like. I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't hack it. Um, but at the end of the day, it was the, it was the right decision for yeah. what I needed to do. Anyway, that, this, that, this isn't about me. This is about your student. Um, that sucks. And there's only, there's only so much that we can do. And at some point, like if you, if you fail, you fail. I don't know. Uh, that student did have a good resolution. They ended up taking it complete and they decided I can't remember if they transferred from VT due to their personal issues or if they you know, decided to take some time off and then come back and you know complete the remainder of the course that they missed the first time. But either way, I, I think it was a happy ending for that person. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm yeah. Happy to, I'm happy to hear that. Um, well, I wanted to. I want to try to. I'm trying to formulate a follow-up question right now. Mm -hmm. But it's, I'm going to fill the space with words because it's a podcast, right? And so it'd be kind of yeah. awkward for these folks to just be looking at us, uh, <laughs> sitting here silently. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. <laughs> um, that's tough. So what would you, I don't know, would you have done it? Would you have done it the same way again if you, if you had to do it over? I, hmm. I think if I had to do it again, I would have put my foot down a little earlier in the semester mm -hmm. because there was a point up until about the midpoint of the semester when they were turning stuff in, like several weeks late, sure, but they were still turning stuff in and I would you know, give them very generous extensions. You know, if I do say so myself, you know, I think they were very generous. And I was definitely playing the accommodating TA at that point, being like, oh, just get them in whenever. Like, it's it's cool. Deal with your personal life first. You know, I would still have expressed sympathy, but I would have perhaps been a bit more tough in saying, okay, I can give you a few extra weeks. I'm happy to do that. But going forward, I would like you to try your hardest to turn everything on time. Otherwise, after a certain point, I won't grade it. Mm. Right on. I think it, it's tough. It's tough what you're describing. Like for in any in any situation, like it's a challenge to like set boundaries and mm -hmm. enforce boundaries. But it sounds to me, and I want to commend you, it sounds to me like you did a pretty good job of like setting the line, drawing the line and like and letting the student know that this is where this is what you cannot cross. This is like this is what this is my yeah you did a good job i think of setting your boundaries there mm -hmm. um so um let's see i have here written there for the grade and importance of geology so i want to circle back to something that we were talking about before your story about your student with the with the mental health issues mm -hmm. um so you said that you had a challenge trying to impress upon students upon engineering students, the yes. importance of geology. Um, how did you, what did you do to try to impress that upon them? Sure, so I think I was, so I was partly interested in teaching them like what was important. One, because I thought it would benefit them to know and I hoped it would help with some of the attention issues that I was experiencing in the classroom. Uh, I listened to some engineering geology lectures. It wasn't entirely for the purpose of teaching the class, but I was also studying for one of the licensing exams relevant to my field. And I would try to incorporate some of what I was learning into my lectures. Now, I would teach them about minerals, and I would say, hey, listen, minerals are important because some minerals weather faster than others. And if you are working on a construction project, you want to know that. Mm -hmm. Just one example where I would teach them about 
you know, landslides and how you know, some of the biggest causes of landslides are like excavations and road cuts that civil engineers have to work on and say, hey, you should be aware of this. So this, sorry, you mentioned a professional certification that you were working on yes. that you tried to connect it. Is this a it, common professional certification it, okay, so, in your field? Yeah, so it's the fundamentals of geology exam. I was preparing to take it, and part of the uh, exam is testing you on engineering geology and the engineering properties of different geologic materials. And so I was studying that kind of on the side in addition to my classes and teaching and research. And so I brought in some of that knowledge when I was lecturing. You know, so I was not explicitly tying it in, tying in the certification I because see. Now, they would be t taking the FE or the PE. Gotcha. Yeah, as so, engineers. <laughs> so this is for this is only for geology and not for and not for civil engineers, not for engineers, right? Yeah. This certification. I mean, okay. there are people who do both a PE, like professional engineer, and a professional geologist. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's kind of an aside. Gotcha. Um, so and the other bit of it, so that bit that bit I thought was kind of cool um, that you wanted to connect it. Well, and if if I. I was going to say, like, if it was connected to the engineers, I think, like, that's a great way to, like, motivate students to, like, be like, hey, this is going to be, this is going to be, like, on, I, I know, I, I'm very anti, like, this is going to be on the exam. Like, right. I'm very anti that as far as, like, a motivating strategy. But, like, if I'm not making the exam, then I feel like, you know what, this is going to be on this exam that you have to take. It's not my mm -hmm. exam, but this is good. Like, you have to know this to, like, be certified as an engineer. Yeah. Uh, I think that would be a good motivating strategy. Um, but that doesn't sound like it's your case. Um, so you also tried to connect it to uh, weathering of minerals on, like, a construction site. Yeah. Um, which is a very real-world situation. But mm -hmm. your students still did not really take to that example. Why? I, I don't really know. It right. might have been you know, just how they perceived me or just how they perceived the class. Like, ah, oh, that's just a 200. This is not even an engineering course. It should be easy. You know, again, I'm not saying all of them thought that way, but I did sense that mentality in the comments I heard from my students. Again, they were not subtle, or some of them were not subtle about expressing their discontent with me or with the class. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's where it's coming from. It's not all in my head. Do you think this strategy, so obviously it's not, ob well, obviously from what you're saying, like it mm -hmm. sounds like the strategy was not effective for all of your students, but yes. do you think it was effective for any of your students? I, hmm, that's a good question. I did have some students who would you know, ask me questions just out of curiosity or trying to understand the material on a deeper level. So perhaps it did work on them or maybe you know, that's just the kind of learner they are. They're you know naturally curious, mm. and they naturally want to understand, even if it's you know just a two hundred level geology class. <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. What else, what other types of uh, motivating strategies? So I think that this strategy, like I like I'm, so. Whereas I'm very anti, like this is going to be on the exam. I'm very pro, like this is something that has real world application, and these mm -hmm. are the real world applications of this material. So. Are there any other examples of motivating strategies that you use in your classroom to get students to connect with the material? Hmm. You know, I would also sometimes tie it into their personal experiences. Like when I taught about topographic maps, I would ask, like, does anybody, was anyone in Boy Scouts? Did anybody use topographic maps while they've been planning out a hiking trip or a backpacking trip? Yeah. Trying to make them feel like oh, you know, I've seen this before. I have knowledge that I can apply here. Mm. There were also some times when I would try to incorporate like cheesy memes or jokes into my lectures. Like before one class, I had a joke that was like, why did the igneous and metamorphic uh, rocks break up? Why did the igneous and metamorphic rocks break up? I was hoping you'd ask that. Uh, so the igneous rock was feeling taken for granted. The metamorphic rock was feeling like they were being treated like a piece of schist, so it was the best thing for both of them. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that one. I like it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like it. Um, good job. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. That's, fu That's funny. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Um, sorry. I like, I like puns. I like puns a lot. Sorry. Um, 
Okay, that's no, that's 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 good. I I appreciate that. I, as a student, I definitely appreciate that as a as a teaching strategy. Like I liked it when teachers like didn't take themselves too too seriously, um, and like they could be kind of like relatable people. Um, I hate the word relatable, but they could be like realistic, realistic mm -hmm. people who like seemed to exist in the real world and have an idea of what was happening in the real world and like how to be humans. Um, so yeah. Um, I, and uh, the reason I asked, uh, the reason I asked if this motivating strategy worked with some of your students is because, like, I think it's, I think it's really easy, like, and I, I have a bad habit of this, so I think it's really easy to, like, fixate on the students that, um, that I failed and the students that are not taking well to my teaching strategy, mm -hmm. um, which, like, it's, it's valuable to think about those things. It's valuable to think about how one might reach reach the entire classroom um and like design their curriculum and design their like problems and examples to be relatable mm -hmm. to a broad swath and as broad a swath as possible of your of your students um but i think it's also valuable to recognize to recognize the little victories and celebrate the little victories of like when something when something does work or when a student like does take an interest in mm -hmm. the subject matter because of something that you did so Props to you for getting for getting some of your students engaged with you. Yeah, I don't know, again, if it was me or if it was just the students themselves, because there's only so much you can do with the raw material yeah. sitting in front of you. Yeah, the, the whole expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. I feel like it's always a little bit of both. I feel like it's always a little bit of both. Like, some students are more predisposed to, like, just, I don't know, to, to wanting to learn. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's certain students... At, there's certain students, I'm not afraid to overgeneralize, there's certain students that um, come in thinking that they are too good for school mm -hmm. um, and that, I don't know, uh, I, I, think of, I think of certain very privileged students that think they're, very, they're way too good for wherever they are and that uh, they don't need to try and that in one way or another they are entitled to just like get their degree, get their grade, get their GPA, get their internship all that stuff and it's really tough to reach those students mm -hmm. um, and get those students to care about really anything uh, especially course content um, so there like you say like there we have raw materials to work with and we have ourselves that can make something out of the raw materials but it's tough it's tough to it it's tough to like I don't know it's tough to like make something positive out of a student that is really just not there not just not not present and not willing to to engage um yeah i will also like present both sides of the story and i think we will get into that or you you do plan to get into that when we talk about my teaching evaluations but you know there were definitely parts where i could have been better at talking to the students or engaging them uh there is one comment that kind of broke my heart um it, it was like you know I'm sure Sissy is a good TA at heart. Uh, she seems like a nice person, but you know, when she talked to me, she was always very snarky and condescending. So I eventually stopped asking any questions or engaging in the class. And I'm like, oh no, mm -hmm. you know, I don't intend to be that way. Maybe they misinterpreted it when I would like, you know, when I answered student questions, I wouldn't give them the answer. I would try my very best to prompt them. Like, you know, you remember this, right? You remember this from lecture. Or can you tell me this? And so perhaps they interpreted that as me being, you know, kind of a, an a hole. I see. <laughs> that sucks. That really sucks. I I feel like I tried the same thing in my office hours. Like I like I try I try uh -huh. like you said I try to lead the horse to water and I try to like ask a lot of leading questions. But I never I never actually I never actually realized that like oh that might that might come off as condescending. Yeah. Um, shoot. <laughs> Shoot. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it is also partly the individual, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I can see now where me asking those questions might have made them feel like they were being attacked or being put under pressure to like stand and deliver. Mm -hmm. Like I was judging them for not knowing stuff, which I wasn't. It was not my intention. And which, I'm like very sorry that if you're listening, I'm very sorry that you feel that way. Me too. Me too. Sorry if I ever, <laughs> if I ever, if I ever condescended you. I didn't mean to. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I shouldn't laugh because I actually, I actually mean that. Um, yeah. But um, so, what would you have done? I don't know. How would you have dealt with the student? How would you have dealt with the student differently? How would you have tried to like um, 
how did you how would you have tried to like take them through this process without and also let them know that you're not trying to like grill them or attack them for not knowing something oh gosh i i'm honestly not sure because it's hard to read that you know i was being taken that way mm. and you know i treated the other students the same way and i didn't like i didn't get any other comments that i i came off as being a snarky, condescending a-hole. Mm. So, yeah, maybe, or maybe part of the answer is you know, trying to present myself as a bit more approachable. But that's that's tough. <laughs> I don't tough. know how to do that very it, well. <laughs> it is tough. Um, it, it is a really tough thing. It is really tough. Like, it sounds like they're, I don't know, it sounds like the student... Okay, I don't want to cast judgment on students, so I won't cast yeah. judgment on students. But I'll just say one of my favorite catchphrases recently is I have to, I have to. So I'm currently in like kind of in like kind of a teaching role, kind of a non teaching role. It's weird. Mm -hmm. um, I won't talk about. I, I won't. I won't really want to talk about it on camera. Um, but um, one of my favorite catchphrases these days is like, "Forgive me if I'm telling you something that you already know." Um, mm -hmm. Just trying to like, just trying to like cut tension and like make sure that whoever I'm talking to like knows that I'm not trying to like condescend them or like yeah for for lack of a better term like mansplain something to mm -hmm. them like very basic and just to let them just like that to let them know that me saying this is like well-intentioned um and trying to let make to like make explicit that I'm not trying to attack them or condescend them in any way right um and I feel like I, don't know, I feel like that's something that I'm going to try because I'm I'm very much interested in teaching, and I remember you're you're not quite as interested in teaching as a career, right? No. Okay, cool. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm very interested in teaching. So like, part of the reason I'm doing this whole thing is to like learn some learn some new stuff about teaching for myself. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, no, like it's so that's something that I'll apply that I'll definitely be applying in, like in my in my teaching. That's something that I got to think about and like letting students know that. You know that they that I regard them, that I respect them, and regard them as mm -hmm. like intelligent and competent and capable people, um, because like because they are. And I think that I think that their presence at the university like is evidence in itself of like of their capabilities and their potential. Um, and I feel like that's something. I feel like that's something that we owe to like everybody, not just university students, and treat them as if they are that to treat them with respect and as if they are competent and capable people mm -hmm. um cool so yeah so speaking of your speaking of your teaching assessments let's get into let's get into that bit of it um so we got into grading standards so mm -hmm. let's talk about let's continue talking about your teaching evaluations yeah or was that the only was that were there more stories about your teaching evaluations that you wanted to share well you can ask whatever question you want to ask about my evaluations Sure. Okay. So what other, what other types of complaints did you get? So grading, I did get the one about me being condescending. I also, so a lot of them were grading centric, to be honest. I also got comments about how, you know, I would just read off the slides and I wasn't a compelling lecturer or how lab was painful. The comments that I did get were phrased in a constructive way. So the students who were you know, being not so subtle about their complaints at least channeled it into a better channel or like they you know, moderated the degree of their complaints when they actually filled out the form, which I was, you know, I was glad that at least I didn't get anything you know, super mean or super obnoxious in those comments. So why do you think you got those complaints? About the grading? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the reasons is that I learned later the other, some of the other TAs who were teaching the same course as me in the same semester were basically giving out lab grades for completion, whereas I did not do that. Mm. And I think now, the fact that students talk to their friends in other lab sections means oh, I was being judged by that standard. Mm. It also could have been related to the fact that P 
people are, you know, people might have felt like they were being judged too harshly on knowledge that they didn't have in advance and that they had to pick up relatively quickly over the course of the labs, which I think is one drawback of grading by accuracy, mm. where you know, you're expected to have the answer, but the TA just taught this lab activity and perhaps you've never seen the material before other than you know a few 50 minute lectures where the professor like breezed through it. I can see why that would be disheartening to a student if they weren't able to get the answer and they you know, their grade tanked as a result. Mm. So, so um, let me see. So how what were the, okay going to the completion bit? What what were the other TAs teaching evaluations like? Did you did you talk about that? No. About them? Okay, I imagine they were a lot a lot friendlier. Uh -huh. um, they were like, oh, thank you so much for <laughs> thank you so much for grading on completion yeah. when a sissy graded us, <laughs> graded us like told us all of the things that we did wrong. Um, no, but um, so why why do you think it was that you graded by um, that you graded by accuracy and the other TAs graded by completion? It didn't occur to me that I should do anything else but grade for accuracy. It feels like it, it feels like it makes more sense. Like if I'm not given instructions on like how to grade something, I would also lean. There was an answer like, key. I would also lean. Okay, so there's an answer key. That tends to that would make me think that yeah, I'm supposed to be using this answer key for something. Um, so why so like did you did you talk with the other TAs at all during the process? Like did you ever like meet up to talk about like Oh, we we met weekly. Okay. Yeah, but grading, the grading never came up. So we were talking about, okay, here's the answer to this question and whatnot. But we weren't, like, coordinating our grading strategies explicitly. Or I guess we did discuss the grading rubric for the final assignment. And I think, or, or no, I decided to use the rubric for the final paper that the students had to turn in. Mm -hmm. now, some of the other TAs did not use a rubric. So we, you know, we did things our own way to a large extent. I see. I think so. Oof, that's that's tough. I'm very pro doing things your own way. I hate being told what to do. Yeah. Um, but like I but like I don't know, I also see the need, like especially in a big course with the mul with the multiple TAs. Like for example, um, I was once I was once the a-hole instructor um, <laughs> because um, I I was very I was in in my second semester of TA I was a lab TA also yeah um, and my responsibility was to like uh, grade and give feedback on lab reports we had like we had like three or four reports over the course of the semester uh, one draft and one final mm -hmm. um, and like the first the very first set of drafts that I got. I apparently apparently I was ruthlessly mean, which is mm -hmm. the their words, their words not mine. Yeah. Um, I was ruthlessly mean in my in my grading because um, I thought I thought that I was following the rubric. Um, mm -hmm. I thought I was following the rubric. I tried to follow it to a T. Um, but apparently my grades, the grades that I gave out were significantly significantly lower than the grades that the other TA um, mm -hmm. gave out, and so. But it only took like one conversation from our from my professor um, with me and the other TA to be like, "Hey Juan, um, you were ruthlessly mean in grading this. Yeah. Please, please, please don't do that mm -hmm. anymore." Um, and then like and then like my grades and the other TA's grades like matched up matched up pretty much more right. evenly. Like we had more consistent grading criteria. So what I'm trying to say here is. I think that in these big like multi TA courses, like it's tough, but I feel like um, you need to have like some consistency in the mm -hmm. way um, in the way that you grade. Um, what would you have done differently? Um, like not not just for not just for the sake of your teaching evaluation, but what would you have done differently um, for the sake of like consistency, for the sake of creating consistently a consistency in the grading and the assessment standard. I would have clarified what everyone was doing and not just made the assumption that we were all on the same page. I might have also brought the professor in 
No, the professor did not provide us a ton of guidance. Or no, the professor, either semester I TA'd that intro course, didn't really provide us much guidance or get super involved in the process of managing the TAs and teaching the labs. So perhaps I would have gotten them involved if I'd caught wind earlier on that things were not consistent between us. I see. I'm, I'm surprised that the students, so just to, just a brief aside, I'm surprised the students never complained like in class about it. I'm, su I'm surprised. Oh, they did complain about my grading in class. They did not say oh. anything about how, no. oh, how come you're not doing what so-and-so is doing? Uh, I see. You know, I would hand, so someone would hand a, an assignment in and this one student said, no, I hope you're in a good mood when you're grading this. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, oh, mm. I'm leaving. Okay. <laughs> you know, that was like the last thing they said before they, you know, shut the door on me. Oof. I'm just like, all right. But okay. Like, do you want to talk about the the assignment that I turned back to you? Because I would be open to doing that if you only came to my office hours, which hmm. pretty much nobody ever did. Uh, but there were other students who I was able to, you know, have more constructive conversations with them about grading, even if it. You know, I personally find point grubbing a little bit annoying from the perspective of the grader. Like, you know, I'm willing to entertain those questions and, you know, return points sometimes if they can make a case that you know, this or that was not graded properly mm -hmm. or, you know, they could have interpreted the question differently. I just feel like as a student, obviously I'm not trying to cast blame on the students for this situation, mm -hmm. um, but... <laughs> I, I feel like day one, I would have been like, what the hell, sissy? Like, you're grading for completion. <laughs> you're grading for, you're grading me on every little bit of this. And other TA, I don't know their names, uh, is grading me for completion. Like, what what's going on here? Um, so the, the moral of the story is that this is all the students' fault. Uh, oh. that, that's not the moral of the story. That's not the moral of the story okay. at all. Um, the moral of the story is communicate if you're in a big if you're in big teaching teams. Yeah. That's the moral of the story. I think um, <laughs> some of the students were, they had different levels of I wouldn't exactly say maturity, but different ways of relating to their instructors. You know, there's a the passive aggressive approach on one hand, and you know the more constructive, you know, polite, you know, hey, what's going on approach on the other hand that I saw. Mm. So it, it could have just been that they came in with these different assumptions. It's tough, especially in a big lecture class like that. And I'm assuming, so this is, I see here, it's like two to 300 students. Were these yeah. all like first year students, first, second year they students? They were mostly sophomores and juniors. Okay. Second, third year students. Well, especially in a big intro class, I feel like it's, it, it's like, it's really, it's a really big deal. Like it's a lot of pressure for a student to like, assert themselves and to like make a complaint like to like make mm -hmm. uh, make a complaint to an instructor in such a big class because i'm uh, thinking about from my perspective i'm just like i'm just like one of 200 <laughs> people like I, I can't be that important yeah um but what am i trying to say here um but yeah no i think it's important in the classroom for students to be able to feel like they can well no not even to be able to feel like for students to be yeah. able to advocate for themselves uh -huh. um i apply i try to apply like a lot of like self-assessment strategies and like all of my all of my teaching plans and my teaching mm -hmm. statements and uh program designs and course designs and everything uh that i'm coming up with i'll have some level of like self-assessment built into it built into it so like i'm not saying that like everybody needs to get on the self-assessment train and like let mm -hmm. students like grade their own work right away um but that's something that's a strategy that um that i think is quite valuable mm -hmm. um to let students like make the case for their own grade exactly make the case for their own grade so because like in trying to build the case for their own grade they like they like have to go over the material a little bit more mm -hmm. and figure out like where their knowledge gaps are and what they actually like how they're how they're processing how they're mm -hmm. processing their process to try to get to whatever answer is on the answer key, um, which I think is a very valuable exercise. Um, yeah, what do, you, uh, what do you think? So I think that would be valuable when it comes to something like their final paper, for mm -hmm. sure. For the lab assignments, it was you know, very straightforward. Here, you do this activity and you 
get the answer or get one of you know several possible answers and I don't know if it would have worked as well for most of what I was grading mm -hmm. but for the final paper I, I could definitely see your approach being beneficial oh. right because like an experiment I guess an experiment can only have like like you do you do a lab procedure and like one thing happens or another thing happens um, yeah um, and like I think that I think that certainly has its place. Um, I think of oh I don't want to get I don't want to dig too deep into um, into assessment theories, but I think mm -hmm. we're talking a about about a couple of different things. We have assessment of learning, like uh, which is just like did you get the right answer? I'm evaluating like whether or not you did this correctly as defined by a particular standard. And I'm thinking I'm talking a lot about of assessment as learning, where mm -hmm. like I'm thinking like. Oh, like do like self-reflective practice, um, mm -hmm. like evaluate your own work um, so that you can know how you like know how you got to an answer and like mm -hmm. how and like or how you did or did not get to an answer and what you need to do to like um, improve your process over time. Um, mm -hmm. And I think both have their place in the classroom still. Like I think using using either extreme is not super is not super beneficial, um, especially. And we've seen it with the assessment of learning case where we have like all of these standardized tests that don't work like the SAT and the GRE that only really predict how rich you are. Um, anywho, I'll get off my, I'll get off my soapbox about that. Um, so let's see. Can you tell me about some times that you've had to make things up on the fly? Okay. Sure. So we did discuss this in our pre-conversation, but it's so it happened to me more my first semester because I was the first one to teach in the week. And so if any issues happened with the lab assignments, I got hit with it bad. Mm -hmm. And so one time the TAs met on a Friday the week before we were to teach the lab activity, as we always did. And we found going through that the earthquake activity in the lab manual that was provided to, to us didn't have a lot of the pieces it needed to be completed. And so we went online to some science education website and because it's on a website, you, know, you figure it's vetted and reliable, right? And it's definitely my fault in part <laughs> that we did not detect this earlier, but we pulled this activity straight into the lab. Of course, you know, give credit and everything, but then I, you know, I lecture, I let the students loose to do the activity. And the activity was that they had a map of the continental United States. They had some seismic stations. And based on some data from those seismic stations, they were supposed to draw circles around each seismic station to figure out how far the earthquake is. And then based on those three circles, there's one point where it is. So it's triangulation. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen those diagrams, right? And they were doing that. And so then you know, this, this one guy comes up to me and he's like, oh, hey, so I calculate this and I get like 3,000 miles. And so my compass goes all the way off the paper. I'm like, wait a second. Uh, let me think about this, you know, move on to the next activities. And then this other person was like, I'm seeing the same thing. And then I got that again, like I'm seeing the same thing. What's up? <laughs> and so I, I just pull out my laptop, like super urgently. I was Googling, you know, all of the stuff about the seismic stations. And it turns out the earthquake was in Alaska, which is not even on the map that they were giving. <laughs> and so I had to be like, okay, how are we going to make this work? And eventually I told them to just go into Google Earth so they could draw those circles the size they needed to be. And so that's, that's the workaround I figured out and the workaround I shared with the other TAs. But now the way, the way I had to do it is because people, not, not everybody got the message about using Google Earth and all of that. I, I graded that activity pretty leniently. Like as, as long as they had something, I gave them full credit. Right on. Good <laughs> props, props to you. <laughs> that story, I've heard that story before, but it's still like, 
it still it still tickles me. Like, because it, one, because it's kind of funny, and two, because it's like actually really cool that um, that you <laughs> that you were able to like figure that out on the fly. Um, I think the students in that section at least were pretty good natured about it. Yeah, and props to them too for like realizing, I don't know, for realizing it, because like I think I think that me like some students might have been like. Oh, like I, this can't possibly be correct, so I'm mm -hmm. just gonna redo it over and over and over and over again, um, which would not have been good for anybody. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I guess I think we've talked about just about everything on my sheet except for the one last thing. Has this thing been? Wow, we've gone for a while. Um, so yeah. b while we so as we as we wrap up, uh -huh. um, as we wrap up, um, tell me tell me about being a graduate student. Okay. Um, what do you think, where is that bit on my paper? Aha, here we go. What are some things about grad school that you wished that you, wished you had known uh, when you were applying to grad school? So that's a good question. I would say the funding situation of an individual student can be highly variable, even among those in the same department, and that your funding experience or your funding situation will dictate your experience in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I won't say like totally because there's other important factors, right? If your advisor doesn't gel with you, but you have all the money in the world, that's not great either. Mm -hmm. And that's not really something I thought too much about because I just thought you get paid to go to school, <laughs> that kind of thing. That was about the extent of my knowledge. Like I knew TAing and RAing were things, that students did for money, but it didn't occur to me like, okay, if you TA, this is a lot of your time that you're not spending on research or coursework or things that directly benefit you or help you graduate. Uh, whereas if you have a fellowship or if you have an RA, your life will be a lot less stressful in some ways or like during some periods of the semester. I know it would have helped me a lot if I didn't have to grade a bunch of papers, you know, when I was also scrambling to get my end of the semester coursework in or scrambling to get whatever deadline finished. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one thing to consider. Uh, another thing to consider is that we're funding for things like, you know, your research or your conference travel is not necessarily guaranteed or covered depending on the department or advisor or other factors. And it's important to ask the questions early on, right? So that you know what you're in for. You know, and you're not stuck paying for a conference travel or flight ticket, or whatever that you can't easily afford. I've been lucky that my advisor is good about you know, funding my travel and you know, research if there's gaps in the grants or anything like that. Now, I've also been fortunate that I've been able to get grant money to fund research and my travels. But again, I wasn't expecting to apply or have to apply for those grants in the first place because my assumption is that you know grad school is like a, a full ride in every way. Gotcha. Yeah, absolutely. The funding stuff is important. And I think part of what you're saying, like, points back to what I wish for my students and, like, us being graduate students, it applies to us, too. Like, you got to be, you got to be your own, you got to be your own best friend, so to speak. Like, you got to, like, you're your number one, you're your number one supporter, you're your number one advocate. Um, and if you don't, if you don't ask for things, you're not going to get them. Um, so thank you for sharing. Yeah. Anything else you want to tell us about graduate school? Hmm. Let's see. I, I mean, another thing I might add is that mm -hmm. you know, the culture or the experience across departments and across different universities can be you know, highly variable. So if your friend or someone you know has had a certain experience, that doesn't mean that that'll be your experience and you should be careful about extrapolating what an individual has experienced no, out gotcha so like so like are you saying are you saying like um the red flag might not actually be a red flag and the green flag might not actually be a green flag like you gotta suss that out for yourself sort of yes 
Okay. Uh, I know, you know, if, if you talk to somebody in the lab group that you're planning to join, I would say that's more applicable to what your experience might be mm -hmm. than if you just talk to somebody who was who went to grad school, but they might have been in a different field or they might have been in a different program. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, the specificity, the, specif the specificity of like the advice is very, 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 very important. Specific spe specificity, <laughs> geez, of yeah. advice, specific specificity of context, um, really, really important stuff. Like I, I'm in roles, I'm in ment a lot of mentorship roles in uh, the graduate school in the College of Engineering and like anytime I have a prospective student like wanting to wanting to join the department like I'm mm -hmm. always like okay which which professor do you think you want to work with so that I can connect you with somebody who works with them so you can get a scoop from them because yeah. like my experience working with my with my professor with my advisor is a lot different from the mm -hmm. from the from the folks who work in the lab next door yeah um, for sure but, um all right Anything else? Anything else at all? Anything that you want to plug uh, while in our last few minutes? Aside hmm. from your aside from your big talk for all the manganese haters <laughs> out there? Hmm. You know, I I don't. <clears throat> Sorry. You good? <laughs> I've been talking a lot. I we there's. Have been talking a lot. Yeah, there are more stories that I could share about teaching or about specific interactions I've had with students, but I we don't might, know. We might have to have you back for another episode. <laughs> okay. I, I'm hungry, and okay. I can eat some lunch. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much again, Sissy, for taking the time to talk with me. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate all of your stories and your perspectives, and maybe we'll, we'll see you again here. Maybe you'll see her again over here. Um, mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very much for tuning in. If you chose to tune in and stick with us as long as you have, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, once again, this has been the, the Ranting Pedagogue, a production of the Virginia Tech Graduate Academy for Teaching Excellence, VT Great. It's great. It's really great, uh, especially if you want to be a teacher. Um, yeah, you'll learn, you'll learn a lot. You'll meet a lot of cool people. It's great. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, Sissy. Yeah.